everyone come in and then we can get we can get rolling Perfect. I think we can start now. So um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening. Um, I think Rahul is joining us in from India and the rest of us are here in the UK. Um, really good to have you all here. We're, um, we're talking about all things international higher education in India and, and what the future looks like in terms of um, all, um, all the dynamic and evolving um, changes with the UGC, TNE, Gift City, uh, to go out or stay in, and and international recruitment activities, um, changing, um, you know, um, visa restrictions and and graduate outcomes recently, and and a lot that has changed um, over um, over the past six months in both India and the UK. So we'll be touching on some of these topics, uh, particularly um, the changing UGC guidelines and what they mean for UK higher in institutions um, to gift or not to gift. What is all uh, the talk about gift city and, and what it means uh, to be setting up in gift and outside gift. And, and of course, um, the wider um, landscape, the changing landscape, dynamic and evolving as ever uh, of Indian higher education. Just to give you, um, just to start and give you an introduction about myself, I'm Ananya and uh, Ananya Bhadoria, and I'm leading the education and nonprofits uh, portfolio for Seamless Global here in, in the UK. And my um, experience has been in the international higher education sector for the past five years. I have also worked, I actually started out with the University of York as an international um, um, in, in country representative in India. And I moved over here to Seamless Global now, um, directing a lot of strategies that um, behind UK institutions looking outwards. So um, we'll be talking about all of these changes and, and what it means, but uh, something that's to be noted is uh, the recent guidelines that have come across from the UGC about setting up a branch, foreign branch campuses. Um, and, and really interestingly, they've talked about being in the top 500 across the world or being really good at, at uh, you know, your subject category or for that matter, having the same quality of education here um, in that is going to be delivered in India as it has to be the same as the one that you have here in, in the UK as well. And um, all of these facts, you know, around um, and, and facts and regulations and people talking about it, um, what does that mean? So we'll be jumping into all of these aspects. And uh, just to introduce the panel here, uh, we've got Ali. Ali Arif from DBT, who's the education lead for South Asia at the moment. Um, we've got Rohit. Rohit is the direct, director of international from uh, University of York. Um, we've got Kate. Kate is uh, the director of partnerships at Acumen. And then, of course, Rahul, who is uh, my colleague at Seamless, um, director of tax and regulatory services. So we'll be talking about all things driving demand in international higher education in India, um, a university's perspective, what does it mean to be in touch with the regulators and, and people from the government? And then, of course, all the boring stuff about tax and regulatory advice that we'll really hear in the later bits of the presentation, but super important as well. So I'll just um, hand over to Ali to begin and, and set the scene a little bit about, um, about what the international changing higher education landscape in India looks like. Yeah, thank you, Ananya. Is my audio okay? Just checking because I'm in the corridor. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. My name's Ali. I'm in the DBT, so Department for Business and Trade uh, International Education team. 
Uh, hopefully there's not too much background noise because I'm joining actually from a corridor in our office as we don't have enough meeting rooms. So hence my slightly weird background and people walking past me, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, so Department for, for Business and Trade, International Education. So my role covers South Asia. Obviously, India is uh, the biggest part of that. Uh, and really wanted to talk to you and, and I'm grateful for the opportunity f from Seamless to explain why this matters to the UK government and perhaps provide a kind of big picture view of, um, yeah, why, why is this important? Why, why are we talking about this in the first place? Um, so in terms of why it matters, obviously UK and India are great partners. I think both countries are moving towards greater cooperation and, and partnership. And so the first thing that I wanted to point out was uh, the UK-India roadmap 2030. So this is kind of a comprehensive agreement between our two nations on greater cooperation, integration. It covers a lot of different aspects. A lot of it is to do with economics, but then you'll find that there are strands of it to do with education as well. Uh, and specifically talk about TNE and higher education. So there's a, there's a point within the roadmap that talks specifically and explicitly about a greater number of partnerships between our higher education institutions. Um, so that's that's point one, uh, saying that education is a big part of uh, our relationship as a whole. Um, the second reason why it matters, I think uh, others will talk about this, is that the timing is right. Uh, and, and I really want to talk about our mission that we did, our, our trade delegation that we took out in September, but uh, and why the timing is right for that. So the reason being that both on the India side and on the UK side, we think that government policies are basically aligning at the moment. So in India, and, and Anya, I'm sure you'll talk about this, uh, we, we will think about the National Education Policy 2020, NEP 2020, um, a big strand of that is greater professionalization and even international internationalization of its higher education sector of india's higher education sector um in terms of you know uh, research collaboration but also tne um a lot of it talks about kind of vocational skills as well and integrating vocational skills into every aspect of india's education system so part of that will affect how its higher education changes as well and is uk tne and is tne from from other places a part of that um, and basically how this aligns to the UK strategy as well. So in the UK government, we have an international education strategy. This is co-owned by my department, DBT, and Department for Education, DFE. It's helmed up by Sir Steve Smith, who's the government's international education champion. Some of you will know him. Uh, and he was vice chancellor of XD University for a long time. Um, and Steve's great. And part of the IES international education strategy is identifying priority countries for, for UK work and uh, India is one of those, one of five. So point one, India is uh, a priority country. Point two is that TNE is a big part of the international education strategy. Um, so the strategy talks about kind of the value of TNE as both commercial activity, you know, it boosts the UK economy, it helps support the UK university sector uh, financially, but also the greater benefits that come from TNE that we know about and I'm sure we'll talk about today in terms of, you know, soft power, UK's position in the world and its kind of uh, image in the world as a whole and then all the kinds of uh, benefits that accrue to students from from studying uh, UK and other TNE in terms of their employability, you know, the quality of education that they receive uh, and just kind of their wider international perspective. So the fact that India is a priority country, the fact that TNE is an element of the IES and the fact that uh, India is also moving towards greater international, I can't even say it, even though it's a key word that I should be able to say, internationalization, uh, means that all these things are aligning quite nicely. Um, so that's kind of the background and the context of all of this. Um, and, and the point that I wanted to make as well is that despite all of this, TNE numbers in terms of UK, in terms of Indian, sorry, students that are enrolled on UK degrees in India um, is relatively low. So it's quite surprising for, for a country of India's size that countries like Sri Lanka, um, I think Uzbekistan even, uh, have more students in those countries enrolled on UK degrees than India does. And we can get into the reasons why. Um, but that's something that we want to change and correct. So that's that's where we're coming at it from. Um, and then if I can talk here yeah, just for like a few minutes, just three, four minutes about um, our delegation that we took out in September. So this was a government delegation uh, of higher education organizations in the UK. Um, it was about 30 of them that we took out to India. So this was in September last year. Some of the people on the call will, will, uh, um, might, may have been on it. Uh, Rohit, University of York was on it. Uh, Ambrose Field was there. So, um, and and why this, this was a, a huge deal is that it was our biggest ever delegation that we've taken anywhere for uh, education. 
um, this shows on the UK side, at least, that demand and interest is really high. So it's, it's a good time to do this webinar as well. Um, we were oversubscribed. So even though it was a huge delegation, we had to say no to some people. Um, and it just shows that, yeah, UK universities are really keen to get out there. Um, so we took about 30 of them uh, with us. So we went to Delhi. Uh, and then we split the delegation in half because of its size. Half of it went to uh, Gift City. So it's good to talk about Gift today and to Mumbai. And half of it went to Chennai and engaged with the Tamil Nadu uh, state government as well. So the purpose of this was really to explore TNA opportunities in, in these cities um, and to look at kind of government policy as well in Delhi. So we, we had uh, first a council, um, sorry, a conference with British Council India in Delhi, uh, lots of Indian HEIs were present, and that was basically exploring the context and, and what I talked about. Um, but then when we visited the other places, we we're really interested in delving down into the local need. And and this is something that I mentioned at the end um, in terms of thinking how does any UK TNE off complement what's needed in the actual region, state and, and city as well. I think that's really important. Um, and basically, we engage with regulators, with state governments, with businesses, with universities, all of that good stuff. Um, and I'll just say some of the, the key uh, learnings that I noted down and, and what we took from it. So, um, yeah, the first one, what I just mentioned about being specific and, and thinking locally. Uh, so India, you know, understatement to say it's massive. Um, it's many nations within one nation. So when you as a UK university think about India maybe makes sense to think about the state that you're engaging with um, state governments have quite a lot of uh, control over education in their states they have higher education council sometimes they have skills councils and, and all of that and they might have funding so and each one obviously will have different employment needs as well and different uh, sectors of the economy that are stronger so um, for example, in Tamil Nadu, we know that they're doing more on offshore wind, given it's a coastal state um, and, and has a long coastline. We know that they're doing a lot on electric vehicles. They want to make it kind of the center for EVs in India. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that I would say to to bear in mind when you're engaging in India, like what's the local need? Uh, what's the uh, Think about how your TNE and offer um, lines up to that and, and always think about kind of graduate employability as well uh, of any TNE and offer. So for example, You'll see that uh, University of Birmingham IIT Madras joint degree is in um, uh, data science and AI, I think. Uh, so that just shows how you know they're they're on the front foot in terms of the future industries uh, in India and the UK. Um, the second key learning I think that we took is uh, the notion of equity and the importance of it. So not assuming a position of superiority as a UK university when you go to India and especially the way you talk to people and engage with them um, it has to be a relationship of equals um, when you are proposing a TNE proposition you think uh, you know obviously what will India get the Indian organization get from it and what will the UK organization get from it so it should be a mutual partnership um, with with both benefiting and definitely not assuming that we're just going the uk is just going there to kind of give its education to india and that's it and and very much like be a recipient of that but rather like um partners in this so so i'd say that's that's really important and especially in india but compared to other countries um and then the last point that i'll say that yeah i think we will talk about this today is um kind of knowing the regulation and getting it right um getting regulators involved early on you'll have seen you may have seen recently that the ugc was cracking down actually on um, uh, which I think involves some UK universities probably of uh, partnerships that they had in India that weren't accredited by the UGC uh, and they're basically trying to stop them so that's pretty major um, if they're getting stricter it's important to know the regulation get it right that's where organizations like Seamless will help you um, and get the regulators on board as well so that nothing bad happens down the line uh, on that note just noting what india wants and, and doesn't so franchise validation and online distance learning not currently permitted on the regulations by ugc what they do want is joint dual degrees and international branch campuses um so that's uh, I do, uh, we don't kind of we're not that experts on the very technical details of regulation but that's kind of the broad picture of what india wants so important to understand that as well before you think about any tne in india um so i think yeah that's kind of the broad look at what uh our position is and, and yeah and, and yeah hopefully that brings up some interesting points to to discuss 
yeah absolutely thank you for that ali i think uh, most importantly what you said about thinking locally because it's many nations within one nation and that's the dynamic nature of india because uh, when even you talk talk about simple things like the national education policy 2020 it's on the conquer concurrent list for india so education is on the concurrent list which means it's a directive of both the central government and the state government to take action in accordance with the regulations of the NEP. So it's a guiding document. It's it's not law, uh, but but it has an aim of achieving a 50% gross enrollment ratio by 2035. And I think that's really important because when you're talking about how the government's going to achieve this with the number of colleges and universities and higher education institutions it has at the moment, um, there is definitely a role for um, international higher education providers, especially from the UK, to come and 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 fill that gap and we're also seeing a lot of demand from uh, you know from uh, from women who are um, who are actually opting to study abroad more than men from india and also the fact that we have more stem graduates who are women in india now than uh, than men and these are like some of the statistics that have been released by the all india survey on higher education from last year and there's a drastic change in the gross enrollment ratios people opting to study abroad and the number of uh, students thinking of going to us canada uk or australia and interestingly, there has been, um, I mean, there is a change in the grad, there might be a change in the graduate route within the UK, but uh, there has already been changes in Canada and in the US and Australia in the past. So that's something that um, has uh, naturally direct directed the, the trajectory of Indian students hoping to study in the UK or, or uh, thinking of taking up a British education. And so I'll come to Kate on this. Maybe she can shed some light and, and tell us about the trends within states and, and what the demand for international education looks like in India. Thanks, Nanya. Um, Sonali, it would be great if you could share a few slides that we've prepared. Um, if you could pop them up on the screen, that would be brilliant. Okay, they should just be coming up now. Brilliant. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the demand for higher education in India. Um, I think we've touched upon and I think we're all aware of the, the demographics, really, and that rising um, youth population and rising middle class um, and the estimated um, India becoming the third largest economy by 2030. So there's that real need for upskilling workers and that rise, as Anan, you mentioned, of getting women into the workforce. So that's a, an amazing statistic that you just shared, Ananya, today and, um, and brilliant steps forward. But one thing that's really clear is that the demand for higher education continues to really outgrow traditional capacity. So there's a real need for new delivery methods and partnerships that will be essential really in um, India. Um, Acumen, we've been with the education division um, uh, of CIM, of Salamast 4, and we really have been doing a lot of research in the background alongside Seamless and having conversations with industry experts and doing a lot of data analysis. And it's suggested that India could offer an additional 13 million students by 2030 the opportunity to participate in international education through innovative pathways and transnational education models. So this really brings me on to this slide here, which is I think this statistic in particular that we've put here, that there are over 40 million students enrolled in higher education landscape in India. And roughly around 900,000 of them traveled abroad to study in 2023. So that's just 2% of that student body. So it really highlights here that there's this ever growing landscape of um, domestic higher education enrollments in India, but there's a large portion of these students that harbor aspirations for an international education, but may not encounter the um, means, they may not have the means to, to travel abroad, they may not have the right guidance or access um, to an international education. Um, we, the Acumen team have worked with a number of international schools as well as domestic schools, and really work to try and get a sense of the student pulse across tier one and tier two um, cities in India. Um, to really understand the desire for international education. And you can see some of the statistics here that I think really highlight that gap at the moment that TNE models can really help to fill. Um, looking at the tier one data, only 19% of students will leave India to pursue an undergraduate or postgraduate program, um, whereas 71% of tier one students aspire for an internationalization within their higher education. 
And there's some sim similar stats for the tier two data as well. So 14% of students will leave India um, and 58% of students are aspiring for internationalization in the higher education. So you can really see that there's um, a huge opportunity for TNE in India. Um, Snolly, if you can move to the next slide, that would be great. Okay. And Ali, I think you put this extremely well a, a second ago, and I'm going to kind of reiterate the same point here, which is um, how we define in the UK TNE and how India define TNE. There's a slight difference, really, and I've I've highlighted a few key um, key words I feel in the India definition. We all know the UK has been a significant exporter of TNE, and our understanding is largely shaped by our own position as a provider. And the UK, in the UK, we typically have a view that TNE situations are where a student studies in a country different from the where the awarding institution is based. The qualification remains the same as if the course was delivered in the home country. And delivery methods will include um, flying faculty out, online learning, branch campuses, and partnerships with local institutions. India's definition is slightly different to this. Um, TNE can mean foreign institutions collaborating with Indian ones to, to offer joint programs. They, in particular, twinning programs, articulation programs, instances where foreign institutions can set up campuses in India. And I think this is really important, mutual recognition of degrees and quality assurance to ensure that Indian students receive qualifications that are globally recognized. And I think this is really um, hammered home within the NEP 2020. The aim is to build deeper and more collaborative partnerships that are focused on increasing the quality and institutional development of Indian institutions. So it's really important that we look at the when we explore partnerships and collaborations in India that we are very much thinking about this from a mutually beneficial means rather than it being on one side rather than on the other so I think that that's a really key piece that we should take away from the NEP um, and I think that really highlights it with those two very different definitions of TNE there so Nali, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide Okay, so what does the NEP mean? So the National Education Policy, what does that mean for higher, UK higher education institutions? So Ali, you mentioned earlier around the modernization of Indian higher education through prioritizing internationalization. And this is being done by allowing top 1000 um, international institutions from other countries to establish those TNE partnerships with Indian higher education institutions. Um, there's also a lot of support for private investments and public spirited private initiatives in higher education now within the NEP. And also there's a movement now towards a light but tight regulation of higher education to ensure which allows a little bit more flexibility in regards to partnerships. So you can see a few key points on the screen here that what how this can help um, UK HEIs and where there's an opportunity to collaborate. Um, particularly, we've touched upon the kind of allowed entry now. So there's much more of um, the bureaucratic hurdles um, that have been in place in the past. Um, there's a lot more flexibility. There's clear guidelines now, which is really helping to make it um, easier for UK institutions um, to partner with Indian institutions. There's also an opportunity and a focus on digitalization. Current um, campus offerings in the traditional format will not have enough capacity for um, the population and the need. So therefore, it's realistic that there's going to be a need for a blended learning and online delivery method. Um, so this is, again, an opportunity for UK higher education institutions to support um, Indian institutions. Um, multiple entry and exit systems as well. So there's credit recognition now and transfer agreements that become simpler for students, which is really important. So it makes it a bit easier for them, but also it makes it much easier for UK higher education institutions. And I think this is a really critical piece. India um, wants to be a global study destination, and that means attracting students to India to come and study. So students from across wider South Asia countries, um, including Sub-Saharan Africa as well, there's gonna be lots of students that, that will be coming into India. So there's an opportunity for UK institutions, not only for Indian, in, for Indian students, but also students from wider regions. And I think this piece is really important. We've really seen this in outbound mobility as well, that tier, there's a growing demand and number of students from tier two and two tier three cities who are looking for 
education, international education, but often they're looking for more affordable education that's going to guarantee them a work opportunity. So those are some of the um, pieces within the NEP that we think is really relevant for UK universities. If you want to move to the next slide, Sonali, that would be great. Okay, and we've mentioned a few of the different types of models um, previously. This is just a chart to show all of the different types of partnership models there are. And as Ali mentioned earlier, these are the most popular programs really and partnership opportunities that have been defined by the UGC at present. Um, you can see the credits that are required and the types of degree that are awarded. We've, we know in the UK that there are 83 higher education institutions, probably more now, um, that have partnered um, already in some form or another um, under the UGC to 2020, 2022 regulations or research collaborations. So there's a number of, of partnerships already underway um, and have been in place for a while. So what's really important is what, how can we move beyond this? How can we move beyond articulation and progression arrangements and set up partnerships that are mutually beneficial, that are optimising in particular the dual joint or twinning options um, and beyond? Um, the Australian government, we know, are doing a lot of investment around um, TNE, not just in India, but in other countries as well. And we know that many Australian universities are very quick to be setting up branch campuses. We know of, I think, two or three already um, that are looking to set up in 2024, 2025. So I think it's really important to see Australia are acting extremely quick on this. And um, the government have been doing a lot of investment around TNE as well. Um, and what I'd love to do is to pass over in a, um, now to Rohit to kind of hear a little bit more from you on the from the University of York and um, your experience um, in India and around the partnership space there. Sure, thank you very much. And uh, a big hello to everybody who joined us today online. Can I just check that my audio is uh, is clear? Wonderful. Yeah. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of this eminent panel. So thank you very much to Acumen and Seamless for this opportunity. Um, my name is Rohit Kumar. I'm the director of the International Office of the University of York. I've been involved in international HE for about 15 years. Prior to York, I was at the University of Bristol. Before that, at the University of Liverpool. And in a previous life, I used to work in investment banking. I was at Goldman Sachs and Deutsche Bank before that. So um, in terms of what I'd like to talk to you about today, just I I'd like to touch upon four, four key points. The first one is where is India HE at the moment and what does the future hold? The second point is the education landscape and a little bit about the NEP. And then the last two points would be around how do universities navigate this exciting yet constantly changing landscape? And uh, uh, finally, I'll cap off by just talking a little bit about York's plans and uh, how we view India as a, as a very exciting destination. So a little bit about the, um, the actual uh, where we are at this point in time, where is India HE at the moment? What's actually happening? I think um, Ali and uh, Kate have all touched upon this, and they've done a really good job of, you know, presenting that overall overall picture. But the key the key takeaway really is that there is no denying the fact that India is probably going to be the most exciting market for the next 15, 20 years, if not more. And why do I say that? I say it for a number of reasons. Um, demographically, that's that's the biggest uh, factor there. Over 50% of India's population are under the age of 30. And so that is that that in itself gives India a significant competitive advantage. When you couple that with an economy that's doing really well, with a relatively stable political structure when compared to other countries uh, in the region, and um, a very strong entrepreneurial streak in, in the Indian uh, landscape, and one point which doesn't get talked about much, but I think it's extremely important in this particular context, is just how powerful the growth of that Indian middle class has been. If you look at similar countries, you wouldn't find any other country which has had a, a higher uptake of pulling people from the lower middle class bracket into the middle class or upper middle class uh, categories now. And the reason that becomes important is because there's a very strong cultural nuance to the way Indians perceive and view education. Education is perhaps the, the number one determinant of uh, how fa families set aside their finances and how they decide to go about spending their money. So it's extremely important for Indian parents and families to, to save, a, set aside and save for their kids' education. And so when they've 
when they move across those income levels, naturally there's a higher disposable income and there's more money that therefore that flows into the education landscape. So when you couple that with a very dynamic regulatory landscape, you've got a very potent and a very positive uh, environment there for education to really take off in, in, in the real sense. Uh, Kate touched upon the gross enrollment ratio. I think that's another very interesting figure. So currently it's about 40.1 million at this point in time. And the government wants to increase it to 97.6 million by the time it's 2035. That is a huge number. And any which way you look at it, India does not have the supply to cater to that demand. So naturally, there's going to be a lot of changes in that front. But it's also clear that India is very keen to make sure that people who would have left the country and that brain drain is timely to a certain extent. And so a large portion of this push towards wanting to retain some of those students who leave India uh, is, is primarily with that, uh, with that idea in mind. Of course, it won't keep everybody back. Understandably, that's not possible. But a large portion of that uh, student base would, would choose to stay back in India, I would imagine, if as the uh, next iterations of this new regulation become clearer, and as more universities come into, into the landscape, then that will, that will definitely change. So in terms of the, uh, the, the current landscape and the NEP, I think for the first time in about 30 odd years, you are now seeing a very clear direction from the government, which is absolutely to be welcomed. There's a big shift away from the traditional 10 plus two model to a five plus three plus three plus four. That becomes important because that holds the key to a lot of existential issues that Indian HEF faced in the past. Um, and, and, and I say that because for the longest period of time, Indian graduates only had three or four routes available to them. It was very rigid, very regimented. You had to go down a particular route and you really couldn't switch and uh, shift if you, if you felt that you just weren't cut out for your initial choice of a program. So those things are, are going to be a big factor. Um, the NEP, I think, also outlines, again, very clearly for the first time, a real step change in governmental policy and national policy on recognizing credits, on recognizing people who want to leave and join back at whatever stage in, uh, of their life they may be. And I think the, the biggest step change in direction has been the Academic Bank of Credits, the ABC, as it's called, where people who, are, who have to leave the, the education uh, uh, system for whatever reason, they don't lose those credits. They don't lose those grades. They can always come back and, and rejoin from wherever they left off. So that's massive. And that's extremely important. Again, if you look into that demographic point I talked about earlier, where 50% of that population is, is under 30, it becomes even more important when you take that and you give the people the flexibility to opt in and opt out, depending on their personal circumstances. From an institutional perspective, I think there are a number of things which are clear, but I think some things need to be made clearer, but I'm sure that will happen with time. So, for example, the NEP outlines that foreign universities, FHEIs as they're called, foreign higher education institutions, can set up campuses in India, and it's very clear how they can do that. There's four routes of doing it. They could either set themselves up as a, as a company using the Companies Act, or they join as a limited liability partnership, or it's through a joint venture with an Indian organization or an Indian campus or you set up a branch campus. So that's clear in terms of how they could commit. It's also clear that the initial license is gonna be for a 10 year period. What's not clear is whether after that 10 year period, will it go through a full license uh, uh, check or is it just gonna be a case of an automatic renewal subject to everything else being met? So those things I'm sure again, will be clarified, uh, but it, it all points to a, to a very, exciting, uh, very exciting direction. And just to quickly finish off on the last two points in terms of what do British universities um, have to do and what, what, what do we do as a sector to navigate this very exciting landscape? I think the biggest change for UK institutions is to, is to accept the fact that India and China behave like two different markets. Just because the population size is similar and just because the proximity to each other and where we are placed globally, um, student behavior and student demographics are extremely, extremely different. And one of the best examples was, uh, it, it has been over the last couple of years, post the pandemic, You've seen Chinese students taking a call on whether they want to pause their education or revisit their plans of going abroad. Indian students are doing the same, but the big difference there is that they've not paused their plans. They've just merely pivoted. So if, they've, if they can no longer go to the US, they don't put their plans on hold. They look at the UK, they look at Canada, they look at Australia, uh, Netherlands, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Sweden. So that is extremely important because student mobility out from India is going to increase. 
the big question for us as UK institu institutions is how much of that number can we bring into the UK into our own respective institutions? And I think um, a couple of other things to talk about with regard to NEP and uh, for UK institutions. A big focus, of course, is on branch campuses. And understandably, different universities will have different requirements. Um, Ali made a very good point about location being of that, that that's key, where we where UK universities decide to set up in India is going to be extremely important. At the moment, Gift City, of course, is being uh, is, is the one location that's come up. It's a it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating location. It's going to be a game changer in many ways, considering it is a special economic zone, but it's also set up to have so many advantages for Indian IT and fintech and AI firms. Um, and when you look at the whole startup landscape in India at the moment and how much money that's bringing into the economy, I think universities have, they do have an opportunity there if they wanted to get into that space or if they already have existing strengths in those particular areas, then that would be a, a natural ally in terms of location. But again, India is such a big country. There are so many possible locations. But I want to touch upon once again about what, what Ali mentioned, the point about state governments being extremely important. Uh, India offers a federal, you know, it, it it follows a federal system, but again, you've got state players and national players, and so it's important to take that into account. And uh, just to just to cap off finally in terms of York's plans, for us, India is an extremely important market. I know everybody's going to say that, and it probably comes across as a cliche, but our view is that we are looking at India not just from a student recruitment perspective. We view it as a truly strategic partner for us to look at growing not just our numbers but also growing our uh, engagement with stakeholders in the country, in the region. We want to grow our research base in the country so that we are working along with Indian institutions to solve problems for the rest of the world. It's no longer a case of we are doing research here in the UK, what can we do to benefit India? It's now a case of what can we, along with our Indian partners, do to help the rest of the world? So it's a really exciting time for us. Wonderful. That's great. Um, and then that kindly, um, you know, that sums up very well what what even India is trying to do through the national education policy and and I think York's plans and and your thinking around gift and everything aligns with what uh, most of the state governments and the central government is thinking around having international universities in India one of the biggest things that I see within the UGC guidelines that have come out, the regulations on setting up of foreign branch campuses is the fact that they have mentioned um the quality of education is should be the same as the one imparted on the main campus. And that is where something you, you know, it's about Indian governments and, and I, I think India now looking outwards uh, towards having that level of partnership, that value in partnership and being equal in those partnerships. So that's that's really a key focus, I think, for, for us here in the UK and, and in India as well. And as you said, state governments. So something just to point out, it um, it might be um, not everybody accepts the NEP as well. Some um, states you have, such as uh, Tamil Nadu or Karnataka, who have separate lobbies about not going, um, you know, not going ahead with, uh, with confirming with the views in the national education policy itself. So it's really important to reconcile those different um, uh, perspectives on on the national education policy on, and overall arching goals that that it embodies as well. And um, I'm, it's also interesting to see how um, the different regulations have also created different requirements for uh, teaching and curriculum within uh, within the UGC regulations recently for, again, I mean, the branch campus regulations, you'll see that if there is foreign fa faculty appointed, they have to stay in within the campus and teach for at least a semester. Now that raises a lot of questions around how many days does it be? Does it mean what are the tax and regulatory uh, compliances that need to be, um, you know, covered when when you're looking at uh, teaching faculty there and and uh, employing faculty on the ground? What does it mean in terms of your entity structures when you're setting up on the ground and setting up partnerships? Um, we have a recent case of a university that um, we are we are um, currently advising on how they want to change their structures in accordance to the TNE partnerships they're looking to set up in. The the future. So they're currently changing how they deliver, um, their models currently deliver within India itself. So I think those are really important aspects and, and we'll maybe have Rahul touch upon these um, uh, in more detail if if that's helpful. Right. Thank you, Ananya. Uh, just checking that uh, I am audible and I hope the mic is working. Great. Right. Uh, so thank you thank you so much and uh, just by way of introduction i am rahul bahedi and i head the tax and regulatory practice here at seamless 
and roughly 14 years of experience in the tax and regulatory uh, domain and I'm a chartered accountant and company secretary by qualification. Uh, now, uh, coming to the interesting subject of tax and regulation around TNE, uh, you know, I, I will briefly touch upon that you know, if the foreign higher education institutions, they, you know, want to collaborate with the Indian higher education institutions, you know, it's like, how can they operate here in the India market? One is, of course, by having collaborations with the existing Indian higher education institutions. So in those instances, uh, even without having a presence per se, there are certain key aspects which needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, uh, you know, one is, of course, that if a foreign education institution is collaborating with an Indian education uh, institution, uh, there is a chance that any such collaboration may qualify as an unincorporated joint venture, which is commonly known as a association of persons. So it needs to be seen that, you know, those are given careful tax considerations. Also, the agreement that we draft between these two institutions, those needs to be, those needs careful evaluation and drafting from the UGC regulatory requirements perspective as well. Uh, any faculty coming down to India uh, or, you know, visiting India that typically involves determining how much day are they staying. Uh, you know, we need to have a look at their passport, the visa to see how much time they have spent here. And that could also have personal tax implications, which Ananya just briefly spoke about. So, you know, foreign faculty teaching here may have to, uh, you know, file or lodge their income tax returns here and obtain tax registration, depending on the number of stays that they have and whether they qualify as a resident or non-resident or not. Uh, similarly, if any online education or delivery of courses is being uh, rendered by the, uh, by the foreign education institutions india introduced the concept of digital service tax commonly known as equalization levy so that's on the direct tax side there's also order which is typically gst so uh, tax consequences needs to be looked there as well and uh, uh, yes any transactions between both the institutions also needs careful evaluation from gst perspective that whether that could uh, whether the services rendered could qualify as, you know, import of services under the reverse charge mechanism or not. So, so yes, it, it's not that by not having a presence here, there are no tax consequences which arise on the foreign institution. So, uh, so those, the, these all aspects needs careful consideration. Uh, Sonali, if you could just move to the next slide. Yeah. So, we spoke briefly on, you know, by not having a presence. However, as you all are aware, India has now opened its door for foreign higher education institutions to set up their physical campus in India. Again, uh, now when, when we talk about setting up campuses, so first came out the gift regulations, which specifically speak about, you know, how campus or a physical campus of a foreign institution could be set up in the gift city. And then there is non-gift, which is apart from gift, if there's any other campus that you would like to set up in India. So those are governed by the UGC regulations. So quickly, if I have to say, uh, you know, gift is uh, basically, uh, it's, it's an international financial service center, which is also a special economic zone and located in the state of Gujarat. It's a financial hub and tech center and uh, for new businesses or for industries engaged in businesses of fintech, uh, you know, technology, banking, uh, uh, for tax and regulatory purposes. Uh, interestingly, as it is an SEZ, so gift from regulation perspective or from regulatory aspects perspective is not a part of India. So that's why you will see that a lot of regulations which would apply to Pan India may not apply to gift. So that's the biggest advantage of us of uh, you know having a setup in gift. Uh, that first, of course, it is not covered by the UGC regulations, and because it is considered as outside India, so there are specific income tax exemptions as well if you set up in gift, which basically gives you a tax holiday for a period of ten years out of fifteen years. There's also no goods and service tax within gift. Uh, and the institutions are allowed to repatriate profits without any restriction. So those are the benefits of setting up in gift, you know, uh, as compared to when you set up outside gift, which we'll briefly cover in the subsequent slides. Uh, and what 
does the regulation specifically state as far as setting up in gift is concerned the primary objective is that you know the 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 classes or the degrees which are being given here in the gift should be absolutely at par of how the institutions are doing it in their home country so that's something which uh, you know needs to be specifically taken care of uh, uh, rest i think uh, as compared to ugc gift is really flexible as far as their uh you know dealing the concerns of course there's a panel you need to apply uh but but they are open for you know any discussions or any uh vvs that you may want to have as far as as compared to a, a ugc so so that's on uh on gift uh, sonali if you could move to the next slide now if if the institutions decide not to set up in gift because of you know any reason whatsoever uh the other choice that they have is which in fact the ugc recently uh, notified uh, you know november 23 is setting up of campus anywhere else in india right so that gives them or gives the foreign institutions a flexibility to set up campus anywhere else in india which they feel you know could be could be beneficial for them because institutions might feel that you know why set up specifically in the state of gujarat why not in other metro cities like delhi mumbai uh, or uh, you know uh, other metro cities of of india so in that case the ugc regulations will apply now the ugc regulations if we compare it to the gift regulations the gift say specifically speaks about qs rankings however ugc does not specify any qs rankings they say you know any global institutions which is in the top 500 rankings be it the institution or subject wise could be eligible for uh, you know setting up in india uh, so so and 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 that uh, that decision is basically on ugc to decide so so that's there uh, as far as the structure is concerned gift specifically talks about a branch structure however ugc is silent on it so you may set up by way of say a private limited or a limited library partnership or by way of a you know a section 8 or even uh, a branch so so that's also something which uh, you know which is a major difference between uh, gift and ugc uh, interestingly none of these regulations speak anything about the fcra which is the foreign contribution regulation act so that's uh you know still something which needs more clarity because uh, any institution wanting to set up here or engaging in the education industry needs to ensure that the fcr is in place or not so uh, so yeah so that's something which 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 needs careful consideration from the from the ugc uh, uh in gift we are already aware that two of the australian universities are planning to set up so uh, you know deakin and bulungong and they have made quite some progress uh deakin is almost in the you know final stages of completing their physical campus and might start sometime in june or july this year similarly for bulungong and uh, uh, you know as far as you know our interaction with the gift authorities are concerned they say that you know quite a quite a number of universities are interested there uh, not too sure on the ugc regulation side you know uh, that where is it exactly uh, but as i said you know because gift is much more open for discussion and much more flexible so so that's the reason i think you know you see a lot more traction over there and uh, uh, and uh, yeah so so that, that's on uh, the the ugc regulations quickly on the last slide if i have to uh, touch upon which uh, sonal yeah so which is basically that if you know all the activities that we were just uh, discussing that whether it's partnerships recruitment or marketing which the uh, higher education institutions plan to do here in india they need to have a proper structure or an india presence because otherwise it creates a permanent establishment risk for them which is again having tax presence in india even without having a presence so it's better to have some sort of a legal structure by which you operate now legal structure of course uh, could be uh, or there are quite a few choices if you want to operate here but uh, the predominant ones are are these four which is a private limited company a section 8 company or a limited liability partnership or a registered trust 
uh, we have not covered on the branch office and the project office and the BIS office because those require specific RBI approvals and may not suit the requirements of the institutions trying to operate here. So that's why we have these four. Again, uh, all four, or rather, I would uh, you know demarcate them between two: a for-profit and a not-for-profit structure. So each has its own set of tax implications like a not-for-profit is not subject to tax in India. So uh, provided you are engaged in charitable activities here in India and you've obtained the tax registrations. However, that's not the case for for-profit entities. You are subject to income tax, GST, and also transfer pricing because of your regular interaction or dealings with your parent entity. So uh, again, FCRA is something which needs uh, uh, you know closer consideration or careful consideration not applicable on for profit structures but definitely applicable on the not for profit structures so those needs to be taken care of and apart from that you know funding requirements like a, a not for profit entity would generally need or would rely on grants donations csr money to operate however a for profit entity would generally uh, you know uh, as far as funding is concerned it would be either equity debt and generally by way of service fees of how they'll operate but yes, uh, you know, any institution planning to enter the India market needs to think through their proper structure because you know each structure has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. And depending on the type of activities which they plan to undertake, they need to decide on the right structure. Uh, in our experience, we have seen that a lot of institutions, in fact, offer a dual structure because the activities are such that they may not fit into one specific structure. Uh, so yeah, I think with that, I will uh, close my, uh, my my presentation here. Uh, and yeah, happy to entertain Wonderful. any questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great, Rahul. I think that's uh, the realities of setting up, uh, no matter how ambitious we all sound. But uh, um, it's the tax and regulatory structures that that you know need to be complied with uh, when when setting up or thinking of India as a well. whole. So I'll now open up the floor to questions. Please feel free to just raise your hand and ask your question or put a question in the chat box in the Q and A box below. Uh, we've already got one, and I actually we've got two. Um, so there's the first one, which is uh, which says this: Is there any indication of other possible locations for physical campus development that may be introduced similar to GIFT? So I think they're asking whether there are any SEZs that um, that such as GIFT that will come up um, in the near future in India anywhere else. Um, Rahul, would you like to take that? I mean, just based on what I know about, for example, Western Sydney University that's coming up um, in September 2025 in Bangalore, which is not an SCZ, but they've chosen to deploy their physical campus elsewhere. Any any information on that? So it looks unlikely, Ananya, at this point of time, but yeah, because, you know, I think the government at this stage, they are trying to promote GIFT. Uh, and even GIFT at this stage, there's just two universities which have, you know, signed up uh, uh, Right. So, so they are looking out for more universities uh, and GIFT is the only international financial service center that we have here. Right. And the idea is to uh, impart fintech courses specifically. So looks there are other SEZ as far as, you know, uh, if, if we specifically talk about SEZ, but the advantage of GIFT is that it's an international financial service center. So, so yeah, looks unlikely at this stage, but of course you're never sure or, uh, you know, how things unfold in the future. If, because uh, if say government plans to, uh, you know, do something similar in Maharashtra, because I think even BKC or Bandrakula complex is also qualified as a financial service center. But at this stage, I think they are more uh, towards promoting gifts. So. Wonderful. That's great. And uh, just our second question there is again on GIFT. So GIFT was an early mover in the opening up of the possibility of cam campus opportunities in India. With the UGC changes, the rest of India is now seemingly an option, subject to local regulations, of course. So now we have like two, two quite different routes to assess. How to go about assessing what appears to be two quite different routes, um, as it seems presence in one would not enable access to the other. Um, Rohit, would you like to have some initial views on that? And maybe if one of the panelists would like to add in as well. Sure, uh, so it's a very good question. And I think it's a hard one to answer because it would really depend on so many factors. But I think the first thing to touch upon there would be having clarity 
as to what your institution wants from India. And also being very clear about what it is that you are willing to commit to India because it's a two-way street. And it's very important to take that into account because that has a direct line to your strategic objectives as an institution. Because if you are looking at this as a long-term plan, naturally there's going to be massive implications on the finance financial front. You'd have to look at what your institution is willing to commit. And therefore that then determines a number of other things. And I think the point around gift versus non-gift um, as Rahul and, and, and Ali have mentioned earlier, the one point there is that if you're looking at it from a fintech uh, data uh, perspective, then sure, it makes a lot of sense. But I would say that we shouldn't necessarily exclude all the other great locations that are available and open uh, in, in India because of all the changes that are coming up. So fully appreciate that it's, it's, it's going to be a hard uh, uh, balancing act. But the only thing I'd say for to, to, to institutions is that you shouldn't they, they shouldn't have to feel that it's only a case of we only have one option or the other. Um, there are a number of other other things that can happen in India, even if you're not looking at setting up a branch campus in, at, you know, straight away. The country is open to articulations, progressions. They are open to a number of other conversations at this point in time. I think the only thing that the government is very, very clear on is not permitting online uh, uh, education at this stage. And uh, I think that's that, that's a fair point. And I think uh, a number of universities would, would agree with that. Uh, and the only caveat to that is that in those cases where foreign universities are setting up with uh, Indian partners or are setting up on their own, 10% of your lectures um, are allowed to be online. So that's the only thing. So as long as, uh, if they have to deliver something online, then you, you're given up to a 10% margin, but anything beyond that is not really an option at this point. So if you are looking at entering uh, from that angle, then there is something to be considered there. But just to cap right back to that first part of the question, I think it really depends on uh, two or three key things, what your strategic objectives are and what your institution wants out of India, what you're willing to commit to India. And what else are you thinking of in terms of your engagement with India? If you're thinking of it from a research perspective, from a wider you know, policy perspective, if you're thinking of India as a hub for your broader Asian plans, then that would also determine how you position yourself in the country. And a number of UK universities who are very reliant on China and will continue to be reliant on China because let's not forget that that will still continue to be a huge, huge market. Um, but albeit a slowdown at some point, then um, it, it only makes complete sense to start looking at other avenues. Yeah, that sounds brilliant. And I think that's definitely the, you have to really determine what it is that your university wants more than what, what is happening out there. So what it is that you're looking for. But I just want to get a sense from Ali, who took out a TND mission out to Gift City um, last year and and a number of, quite a number of universities that went to Gift to see what, what it is like and what, what what's happening there. So Ali, could you shed yeah. some light on what, what their considerations were or takeaways? From yeah. That? So actually, I didn't go to GIF myself. So as I said, we split the delegation and I went to Chennai, um, but, but uh, team members went to GIF. But in terms of answering the question, yeah, like agree with Rohit that um, start with what's your objective and what you're trying to do, and that will inform the rest of your decision. Um, I think the question also mentioned that like uh, one will not allow access to the other, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I don't think setting up in GIFT precludes you from setting up elsewhere and vice versa. Um, to my knowledge, Rahul, what I do you know more than me, but um, you could do both technically under the regulations, I guess. Um, yes, the rest of India is is now possible. So Western Sydney, I think it's called University Setting Up in Bangalore, as Ananya said. So um, you think of what you know, what degrees, what type of degrees are we offering at our branch campus? What, uh, who, what the local demand would be? You know, Bangalore is such a big tech hub in India, so maybe Western Sydney is going to do kind of degrees focused on that. Uh, maybe software engineering, maybe data science, um, and think, okay, w does it make sense to then be in Gift City, or does it make sense to be uh, elsewhere in India? So yeah, the opportunities are vast. Um, I, I would explore kind of the differences that Rahul outlined as well. So. Uh, think about what it means for your institution in terms of, okay, tax uh, differences and, and kind of repatriation of profits, things like that. Um, because that will differ, obviously, under UGC or under the, uh, I think it's called IFSCA, the regulator for GIFT, which is different. Um, for GIFT, I think the tax holiday is 10 years, is that right? Um, so think about what happens after 10 years as well. Think long, longer term. I think there's not clarity on that at the moment. Um, 
and in, in terms of special economic zones, like yeah, I think that's quite linked to the government uh, and 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 to the kind of uh, state government of Gujarat and central government and the prime minister personally as well. I guess it's not a coincidence that it's in Gujarat. Um, uh, and, and the Prime Minister's from there, so uh, it's quite government-backed, is what I'm saying, uh, in, in terms of why it exists there. Um, so yeah, I think those are all considerations. But yeah, gift. so it's not just fintech, it's um, to do with, I think, finance, business, and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, it's a bit broader, but yeah, still they're looking for very much focused in that zone in, in, in STEM uh focus things focus degrees and subjects so yeah the it's more niche uh, so Rahul was right to identify that's more niche what they're looking for there yeah that's that's right and and thank you for that Ali but um talking about like just stem and fintech within gift I I think uh there's just one question from me and and in the meantime if you have any questions please uh do raise your hand directly and ask questions or just drop it in the chat box and we'll take one more question after this so if you have any please do drop them um but just to ask also about uh different states having different states um, you know, trends within within the subjects um, that they're looking for to study abroad, or is there a difference across, say, for gift, it is just STEM and fintech, but for across India, what are the different nuances within the demand for different subjects? Um, and I think Kate might have something to tell us on that. Yeah, I think we've seen um, kind of sh a shift in demand. Really depends um, by state. Um, so I think that there was a point raised earlier around being really specific um, and India is not one country really in the way in which we look at it. We have to think of things as individual states and and we see real shift in demand between businesses is predominantly the large volume of interest for students. But there are significant growth in demand around um, software engineering, AI, um, around data science, but also particularly in the South, there's the growing demand for health sciences. So it's really important to look um, at different states for the different trends with subjects because what it can't be a blanket um, look at India in regards to where the demand is. And I think particularly something Ali referenced earlier around, um, I think it was the partnership with Birmingham and um, looking at AI and looking at where there's demand within employment um, and where there's the gaps and there's a need so around sustainability um, sustainable engineering those sorts of um, subject areas is where there's a growing interest that we're seeing um, from the partners that we work with in India yeah that's great um, any other questions from the audience or um, maybe we can wrap this up now and and um, we are all on LinkedIn as far as I know. So you can reach out to any one of us if, if there are any questions. Uh, but if not, um, I think we'll close it now. And thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Rohit, once again, um, you know, for for your insights and really, really good um, stuff that you told us there. And then, of course, Ali, you, you, you're on the ground, you're here, you know everything in and out. So that's great. And then, of course, Kate and Rahul. I mean, I work with you guys all the time, so I know how knowledgeable you are, and 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 how you you've helped direct strategies for a multiple multiple universities, uh, thinking of India going forward. Um, thank you, everyone, and and hopefully we we have these clarities working in the future as well, and and for equal partnerships between India and the UK. But thank first, you very thank much. Thank you so much. Appreciate yeah, that. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.